you're going to turn 70 this year. What keeps you powered? Uh, well, let me say one thing. Uh, when, a, when a human is born, uh, within him, he's trying to look for God. And this is a constant journey towards God. A lot of people, unfortunately, never ask the two questions. They never ask themselves, what is the purpose of existence? And what happens to me after I die? But whenever they ask these questions, it takes them towards God. The only way you have the answer to this question, the purpose of ex existence, what happens to us when we die, is in religion. And all religions answer that question. Science doesn't. So the, the two ways of uh, existence, one is the spiritual and the other is the material. And uh, for me, if you are on the spiritual uh, road, then you will always be looking for how you can uh, face your God after you die, that you have fulfilled your responsibility as a human being. And our responsibility as, as a human being is the more God gives us, the more responsibility we have to lift to help other human beings. Well, let's talk about this practical aspect of our lives, uh, helping other human beings and the state of the world, which uh, there are a lot of concerns uh, around the world about where it's moving, uh, many apocalyptic projections. Uh, I wonder how you feel about it and how do you feel about Pakistan's ability to adapt to this shifting landscape? Well, the world faces two huge challenges. One is climate change, where uh, the material existence, when we only live in this world for material well-being, then the classic example is how we um, imperil our own existence is what climate change is, how we have ravaged uh, the, the, the earth, and how we have misused the blessings of God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so, so that is the biggest challenge, I think, for human beings, because uh, unless we do something, the world collectively does something, then we face, a, a, you know, we already are facing uh, issues uh, all over the world. Uh, this, the weather patterns and then the impact it's going to have on food security and so on. The second biggest challenge is the plunder of the developing world by the ruling elites of the developing world, where every year huge amounts of money, according to the fact I uh, of the Secretary General of the UN, $1.5 trillion move from illegally. There's a trade imbalance anyway. I mean, the, trade, the money flows through the trade imbalance to the developed world anyway. But the illicit, the illegal money laundered by the ruling elites uh, over $1.5 trillion every year moves to the offshore accounts and Western capitals. Now, this is going to have severe consequences on food, on hunger, on starvation, on, on imbalance between the rich and the poor. And so I don't think enough attention is being paid to the second one mm -hmm. because the, the richer countries benefit from it because they have this capital inflow, so they don't care. But, but the poor countries are getting destroyed. You, you, you don't get those profits, you know, after you finish your journey uh, in this world. So uh, at, the, at a certain point, that, uh, that, that should come to an end. Now, I, I mentioned uh, Rumi, and he wrote something to the effect that clever people want to change the world, while wise people focus on themselves. And I wonder if the current predicament, including the ones that you talked about, climate change and uh, the plundering, uh, of um, of the human societies of the, of the uh, poor countries. Yeah, uh, if that is in a way a consequence of some clever people trying to make the world a better place, because uh, all the plundering, all the uh, progress uh, has been done under seemingly positive slogans. The plunder is simple. The ruling elites, what they do is. Uh, when they, as prime minister and me as a prime minister, if I want to take money out of, from Pakistan and my ministers, the only way I can do it is by destroying the institutions that will stop me from doing it. The judiciary, the accountability process, the, 
the tax department. So when I destroy the institutions, the country goes down. And this is why countries are poor. But what is happening is the rich countries are now building barriers. They are allowing the capital to come in, but they don't allow the labor to come in. They don't allow the unskilled labor to come in. So people are dying in the seas, they're you know, immigrants, and this will get worse. Uh, they're building walls. So the only way uh, to stop this people dying of hunger and poverty and this imbalance is for the rich countries to make laws like they have for drug money, like they have for terror financing. They should not allow, for instance, our ex-rulers have living in millions of dollars of properties in London. We can't do anything to get them back because the rich countries, they make it so difficult for get, let us get the money back. This should change because if really you want to stop this immigrant problem, poverty in the developing world, then there has to be a way that if, for instance, we say that, look, this person who was living in Pakistan has these huge properties in London, then, then unless that person can justify that he got this money legally, the property should be returned to us. That would stop the plunder of the developing world. Now, uh, let me switch gears a little bit because uh, we are recording this interview uh, on the eve of your visit to Russia uh, for a, a highly anticipated meeting between the heads of uh, our countries. Uh, countries uh, whose relationship for a very long time has been conditioned on others. It's been a function of, uh, you know, other processes, regional, global processes. Do you think uh, Russia and Pakistan have reached that point when they can deal with one another as, you know, self-sufficient actors on a bilateral basis rather than, let's say, looking onto others? Well, uh, let me just go back in history. Uh, when the Cold War was, uh, you know, ravaging the whole of the, the world, the world was divided into blocks. Pakistan moved in with the United States. We became part of the bloc in the Cold War with the US. India actually stayed neutral, but it was very close to the Soviets. Uh, now when I look back, I think initially Pakistan needed help because uh, when we became independent, we were impoverished. There were millions of refugees in Pakistan. We needed help. But, you know, beyond uh, 10 years or so, we should have then uh, be non-aligned, independent country, uh, st stood on our own feet, not relied on aid. We became part of a bloc because we got foreign aid. When you look back, foreign aid is a curse for a country because you do not fix your own systems. You do not raise your own uh, revenues. You don't increase your exports. You rely on handouts and it stops a country evolving and developing and becoming self-reliant. So the, the world being divided into Cold War blocks and Pakistan becoming part of a bloc, when you look back, uh, it stopped us from developing as a country. Well, you cannot go back, but you can change things moving forward. So do so, you think at so, this point... So when you, but you, you, know, you learn from history. You learn from your mistakes. Uh, uh, you ha have to know how to take the knocks. I, I guess that's your <laughs> motto in life, right? You cannot uh, move forward in life until you learn from your mistakes. So now what we want to do is not become part of any bloc. We want to have trading relationships with all countries. We have suffered. Uh, India became a hostile country, so the trade between them was minimal. Iran had sanctions, so we couldn't trade on the west side. Afghanistan has 40 years of conflict, so we couldn't go north and then to Central Asia. We couldn't go to Central Asia because we became part of the US bloc and Central Asia was part of the, uh, the Soviet bloc. So what we want now is trade with everyone. And what is the purpose behind it? To raise our people out of poverty. That is the main, any head of state, his main uh, 